Hi, and welcome back to Money Talks. I'm Susan Warnick, and my guests today from Finer Wealth Management, as always, are Mr. Michael Finer and his associate partner and colleague and dear friend to all of us, Gary Kuhn. It's great to see you guys. Thanks for having us, Susan. More great to see you. Information, as always, good information for our viewers. 2015, almost at the end, and what a year it has been. Pretty volatile. Mike, start. Tell us why. Well, it definitely has been an unusual year in that uh, now almost 12 months into 2015, we're exactly at a point where we started, despite the entire roller coaster throughout the year. So it has been uh, quite a cycle and quite a year. A lot of people, a lot of angst, a lot of wondering what's going on. Gary, what was it? Look yeah, I think, uh, I think that's right. During the you know, summer months, there was a lot of, uh, first of all, we had several you know, multiple ge geopolitical events going on. And on top of that, um, concern over what's happening in China mm -hmm. and whether China's uh, sort of years of robust growth were maybe coming to a much slower pace. And so some uh, uncertainty surrounding what China would do to address that. And uh, I think also um, you had a lot of um, angst surrounding what the Federal Reserve was going to do in terms of interest rates. And, and they did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I think that as they've, they've started to be a little better at, I think, uh, clarifying what their sort of path will be over the next year or two, and I think that's why you saw after the summer where we had a really rough summer in terms of the stock market, in the fall we, we had that recovery. And I think that kind of came along with both the Federal Reserve getting a little bit more clear on their path and also the continuing um, uh, sort of marginal strength of the U.S. economy uh, that seems to be uh, not a not going gangbusters, but still inching holding, up. St inching up. Exactly. I mean, just just today, actually, there was another jobs report that more jobs have been added. I mean, and that's something that everybody looks at: the stock market, investors, the Feds. I mean, so that's got to have an impact. It really has been a remarkable jobs recovery for the last several years, and and now jobs are being added. Um, but it sort of is a U.S. story. If you go to other parts of the world. You don't have expanding economies to the same degree that we have in the United States. So There's more stability elsewhere? Actually, less stability in Europe and in certain parts of the emerging markets. Certainly, China is still growing nicely, but Europe has been fairly flat. So they've been actually sort of expanding their monetary policy and keeping interest rates the way they are, hoping to stimulate the economy and create more jobs. While the United States, as you mentioned, has been increasing jobs pretty much monthly. And as a result, there's pressure to potentially raise interest rates because our economy is expanding while some of the other developed economies are not expanding other than China and um, India. Well, the Federal Reserve made it pretty clear during the summer, for example, that they were looking at things like jobs and to see how the, mar how the economy was growing before doing anything, and now there's every indication that they're about to increase interest rates. Right, and I think there is a, a, um, a vast preponderance of uh, sentiment that that's what they're gonna do, uh, likely, Should they do it? likely this month. I think there's a general sense that it's time to, to go ahead, and it's, it's been, what, about uh, five, or maybe more than that, seven yes. years. <laughs> seven years. Yeah. Seven yeah, it's years. Been a long time. And so it's, uh, you know, I think most people feel that it's time to go ahead and on a gradual basis, continuing to take measurements on economic uh, growth in the, in the country as well as the jobs uh, uh, reports, et cetera, through the year. Inflation still being uh, low is something that they take a look at. So I think there's a general sense that that's going to continue. Um, kind of very slowly throughout the year. I, I guess another thought that I had with, re, with regards to that roller coaster this year that I think was a big story is oil. Oh, and, gasoline prices. Yeah, and I think Ooh. what happened maybe earlier in the year and into the summer when we had that um, dip in the market is that oftentimes when you see the price of oil go down the way it did, there's a sense that there's maybe a huge um, slowdown in the economies across the board in the United States and around the world. And I think um, as people got a sense, particularly in the United States, as Mike mm -hmm. said, that things aren't 
you know, that they're still growing, um, that it's more of a supply issue because of the, the, the new technologies that are enabled across the world in the United States to produce mm -hmm. much more oil, that it's more that the prices have gone down because there's just a lot more supply. Well, I think another thing, just from my consumer viewpoint and vantage point, is that people who are far less educated than you guys and experts look at this and they think where you might think the consumer confidence starts to build because prices go down. I, I think it deteriorates because people are concerned that we're never really told the truth about supplies and that supply and demand is really manipulated and that, you know, prices are affected by, you know, somebody pulling strings. So, I mean, in some ways, doesn't that erode confidence? There, there definitely is a school of thought and a sentiment that it isn't just supply that causes this, right. that it's the financial markets that are manipulating the value of oil and other commodities and, and interest rates. And, and, and it is true to an extent because financial instruments are created to trade oil and commodities and other things, and that does have an impact on price. So it is definitely a combination of things. And of course, it's, it's, it's really hard to predict. And I don't think people, there isn't a lot of transparency in the numbers to where people would feel confident that they could understand um, probably what is between that and the currency markets, the most complex markets in the world. Yeah. I mean, are gas prices going to stay low? I think that's you're, you're driving at the, the the skepticism that people have maybe has when you would ordinarily think that wow what a boon to consumers while prices are low mm -hmm. regardless of why <laughs> that that should filter through people have more uh, mm -hmm. disposable income because they're not paying as much at the, and at the gas traveling. pump yeah they're, they're traveling more et cetera things. but it might the skepticism might you know they may be thinking is this for real. Right. So maybe they're not going to sort of open up their pocketbooks quite as much as they would. For fear that the right. rug will be mm. pulled out from under them. Well, if you had told us at the beginning of the year that we would have this, these interest rates this low, this long through the year, oil prices this low throughout the year, inflation this low through the year, and jobs this high through the year, one would expect that sentiment and consumer confidence would be higher. And it isn't. It's been pretty flat. Mm -hmm. And that uh, confidence in the economy would be better. Because if you think about it, we have the ideal economy right now. We have a very strong U.S. dollar, which helps people buy things cheaper. We have low interest rates, which help people finance things better. We have super low oil prices, which help, helps everyone. Um, and we have no inflation to speak of. Yet, the economy is still sort of meandering along. Well, everything is so interconnected. I mean, I know people who are afraid to buy houses because the house that they can afford is far enough away from their jobs that if the price of gas goes through the roof again, they'll never be, ever be able to afford to commute. And so there's that skepticism too, which affects the housing market, I would yeah. assume. So it's, it's all, but here yeah. we are at the end of the year and nothing blew up and nothing <laughs> fell apart and we're back yeah. where we started. You know, we, and we're, we're at the end of the year and do believe, though, that um, we may have a Santa Claus rally, though, with all of those factors combined, we may have a little surprise on, in Wall, the next, Street. on Wall Street. So that although there really hasn't been much of an increase or decrease as for the first 11 months, um, this tends to be the part of the year, most of the time, three quarters of the time in recent history, that the markets do improve and it tends to be the best, you know, November, December tend to be the best couple of months of the year. So we could For, have a good surprise, at least on Wall Street and the stock market. In uh, everything or just certain kinds of stocks? Um, we think generally in the large capitalization, dividend paying, you know, blue chip stocks will be the strength. For example? I mean, say for example, stocks like, um, you know, Procter & Gamble, um, things like Apple, things like Microsoft, the really the big Companies Who that owns Procter & Gamble now? Is that still a domestic? It employee? is domestic, but to your point of They do a lot domestic, of international. The reason that the, the, the big capitalization companies, although they're, they're doing well, they're not doing as well in dollar-denominated terms because the one thing that's affected the economy that I don't think everyone sees unless you travel overseas 
is that the U.S. dollar is stronger than it's been against most other currencies to include the yen and the, and euro. the euro. It's Yeah, the last time the dollar and the euro were sort of on par or one-to-one -one was, I think, around the turn of the millennium, around 2000. And it's been as high as, you know, dollar thirty-five. You know, it takes dollar thirty-five in U.S. dollars to buy the euro. And now it's getting closer to a dollar to a dollar again. And that affects, say, U.S. companies' ability to export goods. It helps us to buy goods, but it does hurt U.S. companies a little bit. So, is anybody making anything in this country anymore? I mean, like, like what? Well, we believe it or not, we're actually the large, the world's largest producer now of, you know, um, cars. Well, we always have been, I think, yes, cars, definitely. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were at 18 million car units uh, last month, which is a rec record, but also of, um, of oil and hydrocarbons. We're oh. now a net exporter of oil and natural gas and other things. So it may not be in the same sense that we were at the turn of the previous century, you know, with textiles or, you know, um, heavy equipment or that type of thing, but there are a lot of other things that we export, including technology and and whatnot. So it's it's changed, but we still are the world's largest exporter. We still, of course, import more than we export. Right. But which is an issue. But it, it's sort of we are a very strongly consumer oriented economy, and so we think those kind of positions. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, we, we, we uh, buy a lot of services. Um, we, we buy products. We do have um, products that are manufactured. We t on the manufacturing front, we tend to be the higher um, technology, um, you know, advanced technology, advanced manufacturing. That seems to be the way uh, the United States is going, which is good. Those are good paying jobs. Um, and uh, but we we do have a lot of a service economy as well, where we have a lot of buying and selling of services. Um, but th but that's also an important part of an advanced economy, and that's where you see actually uh, countries like China are actually mm. trying to move in that direction. Products, though, uh, I mean, there are so many products that are no longer available, made in the United States, and I think that that tends to influence people's confidence in the economy. Am I wrong about that? Certainly the consumer durables, whether it's clothes or the things that we use every day, but I think to Gary's point, it, it's a tale of two cities. The low-tech goods tend to be imported these days, or those that require labor, a lot of physical labor, and the higher-tech products, which still require labor but a different type of technical labor and machinery, still tend to be either invented here have the patents here, intellectual technology, or maybe partially assembled here. So if, if you were to look at um, smartphones, if you were to look at certain types of supercomputers or that type of technology, you'd find that there's a lot more of it, not necessarily all assembled or made here, but... A lot of more, a lot yeah. more of it is originating here. Yeah. We, but we got away from Medical your, technology, yeah, things that's like you. that. We mm -hmm. got away from your point, though. We got off a little bit on a tangent, and I do want to come back to what you were saying about Wall Street and why there may be this gift from Santa Claus, because certain, um, certain stocks and blue chip yeah. companies may... Uh, ultimately, the companies are doing pretty well. If you look at the big blue chip companies, they're making profits. And that's what the stock market is based on, ultimately. It's nice to talk about China. It's nice to talk about the dollar. It's nice to talk about oil. But ultimately, the stock market is a function of the profits of the individual companies that make it up. And as a general rule, they're doing better than they were in the past. The, the, the glide path is slowing down a little bit because of the dollar, because when they translate their foreign earnings to U.S. dollars, it has decreased a little bit. But actually in units and in other measures, they're still doing better. So that should translate into a good end of the year for Wall Street because if you think about the, why the market was getting crushed earlier in the year was China. China during the summer was getting hammered because they were in a bubble. We don't hear anything about China. Anymore. I mean, not, nothing about the Chinese stock market. When is the last story we heard about the Chinese stock market? Right. Nothing, but it was the entire story in the summer. Now we hear about interest rates. It's well, always something. Well, we heard a lot about Greece, and we heard a lot about what was happening yeah. in Europe. And Greece has effectively recovered in many ways. We heard about, yeah, we heard about 
the euro was going to be torn apart because the Greek election was going to go the wrong way and Greece was going to, the Grexit. Greece, <laughs> Greece was going to exit. That didn't happen. China survived. You know, all of these things are noise. The ultimate thing is profits of the companies, and the profits have been, have been good. I think another thing about the end of the year, there's, there is a strong historical trend toward December and sometimes carried forward into January for the, for the markets to be positive. It's just a very, going back many, many decades. And there's some sense that maybe that also, the reason, one of the reasons for that is that's the time that people get year-end bonuses. Yes. And so they take, maybe carve mm -hmm. a piece of that and put that into the market. And, and so just, just based on what's happening economically across the country, that tends to be a time where, where you do oftentimes see that rally at the end of the year. We only have probably about two minutes left. And in that amount of time, based on what we know now, from 2015, what is your, your advice to consumers and investors going forward in 2016? Mike, you first. Well, I think, you know, take a look at your overall asset allocation strategy and generally stick to it. That's always the, the thing. But we do believe that um, the first half to three quarters of 2016 will be positive for the stock market in Wall Street. And there may start to be some headwinds at the end of 2016 because we have a presidential election and that's always turmoil for the stock market. Gary? And, and while we do uh, have that confidence uh, over the next, uh, you know, seven, eight months, we also believe in diversification. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, we feel uh, good about the U.S. economy in particular, but still maintain that uh, diversified multi-asset approach. And as you said, it's very important to make a plan and stick with it because if you start to panic, then things start to fall apart, and you don't want that to happen. Most definitely. No. Well, thank you both so much, Mike Feiner, Gary Kuhn from Feiner Wealth Management, and thank you for joining us. Until the next time.